Well, welcome back to the BK Pet Cast. As always, I'm Bryce. I'm Kenzie. And we are the BK Pets. Together, our goal is to help you enrich and extend the lives of your dogs and cats at home. And today, we are we have a guest that is going to help you do that directly, I believe. This guest is kind of needs no introduction, but give you a little blurb about him. It's Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Um, he has over 40 years of experience in the veterinary space, and as you'll learn later on, he's also the... Uh, I'd call him the king of homemade diets, creator of the barf diet. Um, he came out with the book to give it or give your dog a bone, excuse me, and the barf diet 30 years ago this month. Isn't that right, Dr. Billinghurst? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I was reminded of, reminded of that recently by a good friend called Rob Ryan. Uh, it's too long yeah. ago, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's a long time ago, but it's it's uh, calls for congratulations. Yes. So very cool. It was January 1993, I think I saw that the book came out. So it's changed, obviously, our life and many, many pet parents' lives. So. And pets, too. Yes, absolutely. So again, thank you so much for being on today. It's an absolute honor. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And by the way, that was actually November 93. November oh. 93. Okay, so a couple was, months past was, that 30 year exactly. We're all, we're not quite there. It was actually the 17th of November and I was invited to speak at a Bichon Frise um, annual meeting and this was there I actually launched the book officially. Wow, very cool. Where was this meeting at? Was this and where this are you from in, originally I should ask? This was in Western Sydney, West uh, at, at the New South Wales Kennel Club Conference Centre. And so that's where it began. Very cool, very cool. So how, what, what happened before that point? How, what did you do or how did you get to the point where you're releasing this book with this, you know, world changing, at least in our opinion, diet for dogs? Well, it's, it's actually quite a long story, but um, how do we, con how do we con condense it? One of my professors, who was actually an American, Professor Robert Kirk, he was a visiting professor, came out to Australia, and he wrote, um, or he was the editor, finally, of Current Veterinary Therapy, which at the time was the Bible for us vets in Australia and probably in, in America as well. Anyway, he was a very eminent professor. And he said to us, if you want to learn about nutrition, ask your clients what they feed their pets and correlate that with the health of their pets. Now, he meant what dog food you feed your pets but of course back mm -hmm. then well yeah. over half of my clients did not feed dog food because in Australia this was a new phenomenon in the early uh, where are we? we're in the late 1970s we're in the late 1970s and most people went to the butchers bought butcher scraps and fed home rubbish from their kids, when I say rubbish, uh, leftovers. That's the wrong word, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, anyway that we, that's the way we, we fed our dogs back then. Um, it was very ad hoc. Uh, there, was no, there were no rules. And I remember at UD, they said to us, look, we don't have the disease problems they have in America, but this is what you, like, you may encounter over time. And they were right in the, in the sense that we, we would encounter them over time because in time, we... It, we imported foods from America and started feeding processed dog food. So this was a real, I have seen the epidemiological change from feeding home produced food right through to now where just about everybody is convinced that the only way to feed food is this politically correct kibble, PC. Uh, actually, I've changed the politically correct acronym to poison chalice. And uh, that's that's the the food that we're feeding our dogs and cats now. So I, I saw that anyway. So I would question my clients. What do you feed your your animal now? The ones, cats and dogs, mostly dogs, because that's that they were the bulk of our clients back then, and they still are to some degree. But cats are becoming more popular, as you know. But anyway, the answers I got were those people who were paying my bills were all feeding processed pet food as the bulk of the animal's diet. Those ones whose animals lived longer, rarely developed problems, were absurdly healthy, were being fed raw meaty bones, or just butcher, they, they, we didn't even call them raw meaty bones back then, we just said butcher's scraps and leftovers <laughs> from the family. Often, because uh, animals back then and now are usually bought by young families, we have lots of scraps from the children 
And of course, they're real, in most cases, they're, they were relatively healthy foods, uh, foods designed for growth. And so our dogs back then, that's the way they were fed. So I made this observation and I couldn't believe it. Eventually, I realised that, and, and I did this with my own animals, actually. We, we were, at the time, my family decided they're going to show dogs. And they said to me, well, look, what have you been, I'm probably not in these words, but basically what they were asking me, what did you learn about nutrition? We're now going to show our dogs. We can't, we've got to stop feeding all this butcher's rubbish and home scraps and all this stuff and feed them proper food. That was their thoughts, even back then, mm -hmm. because the advertising was working. And so we started to feed processed pet food. Now, for the first time in my entire life, I had to start, over a period of about two years, I had to actually start treating my own animals for these pesky problems, uh, even as simple as having to worm them. Fleas, itches, awful ear problems, dirty teeth, all these things start to appear. Anyway, I started, then I decided, oh, I was doing studying acupuncture at the time, and I thought, hmm. As I talked to the people there, I realised that what I'd done before was actually the correct thing to do. And I was reading people like Juliet de Varaclay Levy, Pitt Can, um, Lazarus, a whole host of people who'd written about all this stuff, and I realised I had to start going back to what I did. Anyway, that was the genesis of the whole thing because the light came on in my head. I said, my goodness, we vets are being trained to say the very, or to advocate the very foods that are causing the problems that we are now trained to treat. And I thought, how bad is that? But also what a miracle that we can actually treat because I started to use these diets to, to treat my animals. And I saw things that were problems that were probably fairly insurmountable, start to disappear. Uh, th things like seizures, for example, they started to disappear. Arthritis disappeared, wow. inflammatory bowel disease. The dogs that were always fed that way almost never developed cancer, lived to a ripe old age. If they did develop cancer, it was very mild and right at the end. And, you know, I couldn't believe it was that simple, you know, and it's still that simple today. And um, that's my mantra that, uh, nutrition, it's absurdly simple, and it is. Everybody wants to make it complicated today. They want to ha hand out spreadsheets and have computer programs. But to, I point out that the dogs in the wild, and still today, the dingoes in Australia, the wolves in America, they don't use spreadsheets or computer programs. <laughs> um, they don't get too hung up over calcium phosphorus balance, and yet they, their bones turn out okay. Why? Because they eat lots of raw meaty bones. And so, for example... And I thought to myself back then, we're going to find out why these raw meaty bones are so important. Now, I've found lots of reasons since then. Let me just give you one example, cartilage. Back then, I did, didn't really understand that the cartilage was feeding the joints of the dog. So that was why they grew up really healthy. I, didn't, I did know that the calcium phosphorus balance was okay. But one other thing about cartilage, I've since discovered it's anti-angiogenic. What's anti-angiogenic? It stops the growth of blood vessels. If you look at a piece of cartilage, there's no blood vessels growing through that. It's actually got all those factors in it. So this is an important factor in preventing cancer because cancer can't grow if it cannot develop a blood supply. So all these things we now know, and a lot of people are looking, and then, of course, um, industry says, oh, well, We've got to develop a, a chemical that will be anti-angiogenic, and they do that, but it's got the massive side effects because the chemicals they develop have lots of different effects on genes, whereas something that's been developed over evolutionary time where food was in sync with animals, all those problems have been ironed out. It's wonderful. It's also simple. It's complex beyond belief if you actually look at the pathways, but the simplicity of doing it is what I try to tell people. You don't have to have any knowledge of nutrition. All you have to have is a knowledge of what it went on in evolutionary time. And we all have an understanding of the dog. I'm raving on, I know. I'm just taking no, over. No, please here. keep going. <laughs> we all have an understanding of the dog as a hunter, a scavenger. Now, what does scavenger mean? Well, scavenger means they eat lots of bones. It also means they eat lots of rotten and revolting things. So what are the rotten and revolting things they eat? Well, they eat poo. Oh. There's a, there's a technical term for that. We call it coprophagy. So they're coprophagic. 
oh, much nicer. But it's really been as though you poop. Um, they, if you ever had a dog that lives in a house with a toilet bowl and the seat's up, they'll go and have a drink out of it. If you have a garbage can full of rubbish, they'll go and have a feed out of it. They will go and lick each other's backsides and their own and their genitals. Now, why do they do that? Well, one, because they can. And two... <laughs> And that's important that's uh, for themselves anyway. And, uh, and, the, and the, the recipient doesn't seem to mind either, but that's okay as well, <laughs> apparently. Um, although it does cause hilarity at dinner parties, let me tell you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the recent example, but that doesn't, that's beside the point. But this is instinctive behaviour, where they're actually fueling their own microbiome. And today, of course, what we do, even with raw food... The, the the, um, the government bless them in their desire to keep us all healthy and baby us along in the world, um, treat us <laughs> like kids. They say we must have that food absolutely devoid of any microbiome. So we do all sorts of terrible things to the raw food to remove the microbiome. But anyway, but then again, I've actually teamed up with this mob here, Gussie's Gut, my, my mate um, Rob Ryan, who uh, is now producing a fermented food to overcome part of that problem. Anyway, you did ask me a question. How did I come to be involved in this? Well, it was through experience. Now, it wasn't that I woke up, as you can say from what I've just told you, it wasn't that I People think, oh, did you just wake up one day and sort of dream this up? Nah. This is what I saw with my own eyes and realised and then followed up with a lot of research. And then, let me tell you also, it took me about a year to write the introduction to this book and I showed it to a friend of mine. I said, I can't get out of the introduction. He said, mate, that's the book. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> he said, he was a publisher. He said, you've actually got to divide it into chapters, Ian. Oh, yes, I guess. So <laughs> anyway, I love that. I, I sat down and divided it into chapters. But it was aimed pretty well at young kids because I thought, I, you know, if you read an academic book on nutrition, it's boring beyond belief. I see if somebody wants to learn about this and know how simple it is, they're not going to read that academic treatise where you talk about energy and how much nutrient must be related to energy. I didn't quite realise the importance of looking at this as food, excuse me, as food back then, but I do. We need to look at food, real food. All right, I'm going to stop there and... Uh, no, I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love questions. it. So uh, kind long. of, no, you're totally fine. Going a little bit off of what you said. So uh, we are obviously on the very extreme end of what I would call informed pet parents. We live this life. Like this is our, our career now. But for most pet parents, they are really overwhelmed at the idea of feeding their dog a homemade diet. Why do you think that has become a thing? Why do you think all of a sudden in the last, you know, couple of decades or even a uh, couple of half or half centuries, I should say, people now are very afraid to feed their dogs because of nutritional deficiencies or because of foodborne illnesses, especially in the raw world. Why do you think that's become a thing? Well, it's, it's all down to two words, veterinary training. Who trains the vets in nutrition? Please say more. <clears throat> it's the pet food companies that train them. If you look on, I looked on, actually looked on Hill's website the other day, and they said, and, and, and this is, I'm just quoting what they said, they listed a few dangerous foods. Among them was um, obviously chocolate, onions, raw meat. Up there, <laughs> up there with onions and chocolate. Now, what pet parent is ever going to, if, if that's, and vets, if you go into Sydney University, on the door of the of the training room where they train the young vets is emblazoned hills. So these people train our vets, okay? And it's not only hills, there's many other pet food companies that train our vets, representatives of the pet food companies. So I understand the pet food companies, they want vets to promote their products, and that's totally understandable. And the only way they can do that is to scare the vets into believing. And, and remember, these are impressionable young kids that are in veterinary school for the most part. I mean, it's, it's a bit like teachers, in, in, at least in Australia, I'm not sure anywhere else, but in Australia, teachers go from school to teachers' college, they're out to teach kids. They've never had any experience in the real world. 
our veterinary students mostly, for the most part, have never had an experience in the real world, including, in many cases, feeding the pets. And, and mum fed the pets, but anyway, mum poured it out of a bag anyway. So mm -hmm. that's their whole experience. And then what are they told about nutrition? Well, the vet says, well, look, even I can't feed your pet. I have to leave it in the hands of the pet food companies. And the pet food companies say, well, we can't feed it without the help of a somebody with a PhD in nutrition. So the belief has come down that feeding pets requires a doctorate from a university plus a veterinary degree in order to be able to formulate a food. So in addition, the pet food companies train our vets to believe that they have to be mortally afraid of bugs, bones and balance. So mm -hmm. your vet will, a vet is trained to think this way, that food that is unbalanced, that it doesn't have quite enough magnesium, that the manganese is a bit out of whack, the copper is not quite right, all of that stuff, that you are going to bring disaster down on your pet's head if you don't get that right and if you don't get it right at every meal. Now they don't make any thought about, hmm, I don't do that for myself but they somehow think that the dog is and the cat are different. They're not. They are, if you're going to feed something completely unsuitable for the dog and turn it into something that doesn't appear to cause problems. And that's what we do with pet food. We take something that's completely unsuitable, grain as the base, high in carbohydrates, totally cooked it has to be because grain is in, un, indigestible without it, and totally devoid in anything living and not in any way related to the type of food the animal ate in the first place. And so they're just looking at amino acids, um, fatty acids and minerals and there's a list put out by AFCO. As long as that stuff, as food contains that, it passes. That's the analysis way. The other way is to take, I think it's eight dogs if six of them survive without losing more than 20% of their weight and they don't appear to have any health issues over a six month period, the food passes. And it passes even if the analytical method didn't work. So pretty well, anybody can get anything approved by AFCO, put it on the label, and the people are gonna believe it. But they believe that that food has everything their dog needs. And of course, it doesn't. For example, it doesn't have any of the phytochemicals. It doesn't have any enzymes. It doesn't have any probiotics. Actually, some of it does because when the dry food is left out to uh, dry in the factory, those factories, because they bring in food that is highly contaminated, which then needs to be cooked to death, um, it's full of bacteria in the atmosphere. And of course, there's a lot of dry foods have been recalled because of gastrointestinal problems for that very reason. So that, But we're filling here the microbiome with something that the microbiome doesn't really want to be uh, filled with, but we assume it's okay. Oh, it just goes on and on. But to answer your question, that's why, because veterinary training and veterinary training is by pet food companies and the vets are trained to be mortally afraid of food, real food. Isn't that terrible? And if you go and ask them, what do you feed yourself? They, 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 m most of the young people these days are well aware of health. I even, um, I'm, I, had, I was doing a radio program once and the fellow that, um, fellow that followed me was a naturopath for humans. And he said to me one day, he said, I've got real problems with my dog. I said, what do you feed him? He said, I feed the very best. Oh, I said, he said, right. I said, what? He said, I buy the top of the line dry dog food and mentioned a, 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 a I said, mate, you're, you're a naturopath and you feed yourself, your dog that rubbish. What, do you, what have you been telling? I listened to you after the, we, we would drive home and listen to him on the way home. I said, why don't you do something similar for your dog? Anyway, I gave him a copy of Give Your Dog a Bone and he, he was smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy because like us, you know, we've been trying to start taking our health more serious for the last couple of years now, especially as we're starting to come out of college and stuff. But you, when you kind of, that light bulb goes, goes off in your brain, you're like, why is my dog eating cereal 24 seven, you know? And, and not only that, but the same exact thing every single meal without mixing it up and so it's pretty crazy to learn about but i want to ask you one of the big arguments against especially raw food <clears throat> and 
homemade food, is you'll hear people say, oh, you know, Big Kibble or the Big Five or whatever have all of these studies backing them. Like, they're very well studied, all of these, you know, boutique diets, these exotic diets, they don't have any studies behind them. Is there validity to that? <laughs> well... You know, I, I don't know where to go with that one because <laughs> all, all I've ever so, done So, okay, let me ask you this. One awful, you... one awful food with another. That's their studies. And if one awful Oh, okay, food, say more about that. If one awful food is marginally better than another awful food, then that's then touted as, and, and has had some ingredient put in that was that much different. It might be, say, tartar control. And there was a 10 or 15 percent improvement in the level of tartar. They can legally say from that study that this has tartar control. Now it's got nowhere got near it. the tartar control of feeding real, real food, but nevertheless, it's a study. And got every it. Study... so the, these studies may not be. They may be studies done. I mean, we've obviously learned that a lot of these studies are done internally, but they're studies that, like you're. It sounds like you're saying they're comparing their food to one they probably know is a little bit less superior and calling it a great food because it beat the other one. Is that correct? Correct. And, and you can do any studies that will be scientifically valid, but really are, are, are in many ways meaningless in terms of... It's from the, it's from the origin question, it sounds study. like. Yes. It's Got it. All, every study, that, and if there is a study... That, is, that shows that the food they are feeding is pretty bad. Of course, it never is published. But what studies they never do is to take a really good, properly formulated raw food and pitch it against these kibbles over a lifetime. But those studies are going on all the time, and it's happening in every veterinary hospital around the world. Mm -hmm. And if somebody was to pull out the records of all the raw-fed dogs and look at number of vet visits... Age at death, um, that that would that would do that would that would simply do, um, and perhaps which which diseases were were diagnosed, I think we would find a huge difference. But no, the only time I saw that epidemiological study was actually at a Hills conference in Sydney, and it was carried out by Professor Rick Reed, who incidentally went through with me, and then he went over to, I just became a vet, he became a professor, anyway. He did this study. He looked at all the records of dogs over a period of time and he observed that in Australia, prior to the introduction of processed pet food, the only disease problems that young dogs got were what they call nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. And what that actually means is that they were de deficient in calcium in their bones and that they literally had bones that, that fell to pieces as they grew up. So they were just a calcium deficiency. Got and it. then, and, and there were just a few of those. There weren't a lot of those, there, but there was, a, there was a small but significant. And these were dogs being fed a meat-only diet. People hadn't fed bones, quite simple. Mm. Then, after the introduction in Australia, which came through in the, around about the mid-80s to, to 90s, sorry, mid Late 70s, mid 80s, we started to see this stuff come in. And this conference was in 1988. He said, from that period, we have gradually seen a, a decrease in these calcium deficiency type syndromes in young dogs and a huge increase in orthopedic disease. Mm. He didn't correlate it. Actually, he didn't correlate <laughs> it with the processed pet food introduction. I did. He just said, we don't know why it's happened. It didn't like, bother to ask the question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, I, I, I listened to that and I thought, oh, my goodness. You people, you are so dumb or I'm dumb or something. But <laughs> <laughs> it's so obvious. It sticks out like the proverbial <laughs> mention, I guess, on a recorded show. But it does. It sticks out. We started, we stopped feeding raw meaty bones because they were described as dangerous and we started feeding lots of kibble and suddenly we had these terrible orthopedic diseases which prompted me to write the book Grow Your Pups With Bones. 
Um, this is probably the. It's actually it was it was designed to be the breeder's bible, and any breeder that got it read it started to use those um, principles to feed their young dogs and didn't tell anybody because that's the way breeders are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, kept it to themselves because so then it produces healthier dogs. <laughs> so I'm not telling anybody about yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, when talking about specifically a raw diet, one of the biggest scares that you hear from everyone these days is foodborne illness, salmonella, E. coli, all of these things. So we know that those do exist in some of the raw foods, but why is it that dogs and cats that you've seen can eat these without experiencing much of the effects? And do you see a lot of dogs that get sick from salmonella or things like that? Okay, brilliant question. Where do I begin? But I'll begin. <laughs> we we produced a dog food, or my wife and I, was raw um, for about 15 years. We had somebody make it for us. We didn't personally sit at home. And, and we shipped it to around Australia. We shipped it to um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Indonesia. Hot countries. All we saw was health. We did not see any foodborne illness. So the question is wow. why? The question is why? We have to understand our immune system. Our immune system is not designed to fight bugs. Our immune system is designed to live in harmony with our environment. We live in an ecosystem full of bacteria. They can include potential pathogens, E. coli, Campylobacter, Listeria, whatever, doesn't matter. We have those constantly surrounding us. Now, if we eat enough of them in our food and we eat the toxins that they produce in enough quantity, we might get something like salmonella poisoning. I'm talking about humans here. Could happen to dogs too, but their bodies are designed because they're scavengers and they've worked with bugs that are potentially pathogenic for literally millions of years. They have a capacity borne out by evolutionary processes to deal with these things. And that's why they can be coprophagic, why they are coprophagic, why they can lick each other's backsides and so on and so forth. They can take it in. Now, is it due to the hydrochloric acid being uh, a lower pH, pH in their stomach? Maybe. Is it due to uh, things like IgA, immunoglobulin A, which is on all surface, in like in, on mucous membranes, so throughout the gastrointestinal system, the eyes, the genitals, all that stuff. So is it due to that? I don't know. It could be. Is it due to the interface between the, if you think of the, um, the gut and its microbiome, the gut is actually outside the body in a sense. Everything passes through. But there's an interface, which is the uh, villi and, and all the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Now, they have been designed over millions of years to deal, to cope, to live in harmony with the bacteria that come through. If, for example, we don't send bacteria through, this is how we develop, for example, a lot of our autoimmune diseases. It's important mm -hmm. that we have these things. It's important that we get a little bit of Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria. If we don't, when they do come through in overwhelming numbers, the body has no remembrance and the immune, immune, immunology system is a remembering system and it's a very adaptive system and it's adapted to look at what's there and say, I'm going to deal with that this way or that way. And we don't fully understand that. It's complex beyond belief. In fact, our whole bodies are complex beyond belief. But they're there They've and I want to bring in something this is one of my most important quotes. It's by a um, Professor Theodosius Dobbs Hansky. I think he died in around about mm, maybe 20 years ago. He was a Ukrainian Russian when Ukraine was part of Russia. Oh, God's trying to go back now, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but he was a geneticist and he migrated to America and became one of the most famous geneticists. And he was a, a person who increased our knowledge and how we handle Darwin's theory. But he said this, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So we have to look at everything. How did this evolve? How did our eyes evolve? How did our hands evolve? How did our gastrointestinal systems evolve? 
how did our relationship to food evolve? So this is where this is the crux of the matter. Unless we understand our relationship with evolution and how we evolved, how our dogs evolved. Now, if we look at how our cats evolved, for example, cats evolved, and we call it obligate carnivory. About 80% of their food must be derived from other animals. And because they are obligate carnivores, for example, they can't convert vitamin A, sorry, they can't convert beta, or beta, I think as you say in America, beta, beta or beta carotene to vitamin A. They can't do it. And there's a whole other, other adaptations. There's physiological adaptations in the way they um, convert protein into uh, sugar, for example. We, we humans and dogs can turn off our ability to convert protein into sugar. It's called, um, well, don't worry about what it's called, but the conversion of protein to sugar is an important factor in our lives. But we don't have to do it because we, we do eat some sugar in our diet. Now, the, the cats, which never ate any sugar in their diet because they ate other animals pretty well, they lost the ability to turn off that machinery when there was sugar in the diet. So they continually um, convert protein into sugar. So if we feed them a high sugar diet, which is what we feed them now, because effectively when you feed them a high carbohydrate diet, they continue to produce sugar. And we wonder why they get type 2 diabetes, because their sugar is so high. So simply just observe what an animal does in nature. And if you, the definition of nature is really its evolutionary background. That's the real definition of nature, what the evolutionary background of this animal is. So if we look at the evolutionary background and we try to mimic that as closely as possible in so many ways then we're going to have a healthy animal. Now, it even comes down to the fact that I think that we, for example, today are trying to feed our dogs because it's a commercial imperative. That's the only way you can sell dog food for each meal to be complete and balanced. I believe even that shortens their lives because they are designed not to eat a complete and balanced diet at every meal. Think about that. Yeah, wow. That's I mean, they, they fast and they eat different animals and... Like scavenge, like you yeah. were saying. Wow, You've I've got never it. thought about it that way. So, so the fact that we do something that's unnatural, that's non-evolutionary, such as that, which is, a, which is a, a commercial imperative, it's an industrial imperative, but it's not an evolutionary imperative. Fasting wow. is an evolutionary imperative. Um, not eating at regular times is another evolutionary imperative. But our dogs will train us to feed them at, at regular times. Our oh, dogs yes. have trained us, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But it's, it's easier yeah. on your life. I actually said that in Give Your Dog a Bone. It's easier on your life. If you have a busy lifestyle and you're in and out and you're not always home at the same time, if you... And I, and I said it for that reason, without realising, although I did realise that dogs in evolution would, would always, would, you know, there's not going to be a rabbit turn up at four and another one at seven o'clock in the morning. That's not, mm -hmm. not the way the system works. So I realised that it was okay to, to, um, to, to feed at irregular times. Everybody said, you've got to feed regularly. No, you don't. There's so many laws and imperatives out there that are 100% wrong. And they're actually leading yeah. to problems. Yeah, makes total sense. So I want to get into the specifics of the BARF diet. So um, the BARF diet, obviously, it's a it's a set of, of ratios that is kind of like a recommended uh, guideline for people. Can you talk about, you know, those specific ratios and why you chose those? Well, okay. Firstly, whatever I tell you now is not fixed in stone. Got it. Okay, Understood. but let's think of our pyramid, okay? At the bottom, raw meaty bones. Probably derived from a young animal like a chicken or any a young, a young pig or a young cow, whatever. But that's raw meaty bones at the bottom. So it's got meat, it's got cartilage, it's got the marrow in the bones, it's got the calcium and phosphorus balance in the form that the body is adapted to use. So... It's got all that stuff. It's got, it's got a balance of um, proteins and amino acids. It's got fats. It's got fat-soluble vitamins. It's got all the blood-forming elements from that. 
it is almost a complete and balanced diet on its own. It is not just a source of calcium, as people think. Okay. That's even so that's us. Even I get catch myself being like, oh, yeah, feed bones because they, they provide calcium, and that's about it. But it <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. That's, that's, so it provides a whole – and it imp- provides emotional satisfaction to your dog. In yes. fact, it's so satisfying that dogs will fight each other to get it. So, in <laughs> fact, I know I do, I'm diversing here as fraction, but when I was a lot younger and I had lots of dogs and I had more energy to deal with lots of dogs, we had them all living on a farm at the time, had star posts in the ground with chains on them, and they were all chained up and at mealtimes. And this was a regular thing, actually. I don't think about it, but that's, but it had to be because that's what my life was at that time. They were chained up. I would put the bone, raw meaty bones, down in front of them, and they were not allowed to eat until I told them to. So that was training. It was because I knew that if these were big dogs, a lot of them, they were rescues, and some of them were, you know, uh, great Danes and all sorts of things. So I knew that they would fight anyway. So bones are so important. That's why. That's why I call it give your dog a bone. Okay, so that's the bottom of the pyramid. Now, the next two tiers are quite interchangeable, organ meat and vegetables. Organ meat, kidney, liver and heart as, 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 a, as, as the basis of it. Um, and I usually say kidney twice as much as, sorry, liver twice as much as kidney and heart, approximately. But, you know, that's not written in stone either. So then probably about equal, maybe slightly less sometimes, maybe more for an older dog, are the vegetables. Seasonal, low glycemic index, put through a juicer, recombine the juice and the pulp to mimic the gut contents of the cow. Or to mimic the gut contents. So it's kind of like a pre-digested form of vegetables. That's the thinking there? Uh, Yes, partly pre-digested. Now, the top layer uh, helps accommodate the fact that those vegetables aren't fermented. The top layer consists of, now this is, for simplicity, the top layer, so we've got raw meaty bones, organ meat, vegetables. The top layer is poo substitutes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So the top layer is poo. Is poo. But we don't. It's poo substitutes. Because we, well, if you live on a farm, your dog will eat poo. There's no mm-hmm. question. Unless you chain him up in the house and instruct him never to eat poo, which would be a sort of thing to do. <laughs> anyway. Or, if, or even in our place uh, or our area, possums or whatever. But anyway, dogs eat. What's in poo? Think about poo for a second. Let's think of um, herbivore poo. So it contains lots of fiber. Prebiotics. Mm, interesting. What we call prebiotics. Everything, actually, all food is a prebiotic. But think about that because it's, it's all worked on by bacteria. It's also worked sure. on by a, a huge animal that is, is passing through and, and who happens to be a living organism as well. And we're trying to keep it that way. So anyway, so it's got, it's got these so-called fiber prebiotics. It's living bacteria and dead bacteria. Now, what are bacteria? They're living creatures. We're feeding living food. What's living food got? It's got first-class protein. It's got essential fatty acids. It's full of vitamins, particularly the B vitamins and also vitamin K. Wow. This is, this is pretty fancy stuff. Um, I can tell you a story about a, a groom in England. He, they ended up, well, I don't know if they sacked him, but he was fastidious. He was looking after the horses, and he would not let the foals eat any of their mother's poo. Those foals ended up with chronic diarrhea, which they couldn't control, and they were dummies. Wow. But their brain never developed properly. Wow, because they that's... weren't getting mum's poo. So they weren't f- feeding their microbiome and they weren't actually getting the essential fatty acids they needed for their brain to develop. That's now, unreal. We, we have a situation today where we have the enormous problem with behavioural problems in dogs. And a lot of that starts right at the very beginning where they were never fed properly. So they didn't get the correct balance of essential fatty acids. And if you think about the brain, what's it made of? Well, it's made of fat. So somebody calls you a fathead. That's pretty good, really. Um, <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> but most of us, would you believe, saturated fat. Wow. Wow. But it's also some important parts mm-hmm. of cholesterol. Cholesterol, by the way, is vitally important. Um, cholesterol is important to us. 
uh, and also the DHA, EPA, all that stuff, all those essential uh, fatty acids that we know about, the long chain ones with um, three double bonds. Anyway, so that's, we're starting at the third carbon from the omega end, and that's why they're called omega threes. But hey, who cares about that? Nobody. Mm. Their omega threes are important, <laughs> and, they, and they've got to be, they've got to be fresh, otherwise they go rancid. And by the yeah. way, why do they come from yes. cold water fish? Because if cold water fish didn't have them, they would be stiff as a board, because the omega threes are very, oh. very liquid and keep moving. And so if you, you won't get them in tropical fish, but you'll get them in the very cold water fish. So that's something to think about. So there we have it. Yeah. We have poo substitutes at the top. So this is a rationale for extra high quality protein like eggs, uh, maybe throwing in some essential fatty acids in the form of fish oil. Fish oil, by the way, is better than flaxseed oil in many ways because it's activated. And in many, particularly in sick dogs, they can't convert the inactivated form of the omega-3 to the activated form. So, so do that. Um, it contains probiotics, prebiotics, and high-quality protein. So we just put in things to count for those. Now, a lot of people have, with this 80-10-10 um, rubbish um, want to say, well, the BAF diet's missing stuff. No, they just don't understand the BAF diet. The BAF diet is feeding what the dog evolved to require, and it takes into account all the things that I've spoken about today. Got it. And so one theme I'm noticing from everything you're saying is it sounds like variety feeding is pretty important. It sounds like rather than focusing on getting the exact nutrient level to a certain spot, we should instead be focusing on just kind of feeding, you know, roughly those categories, like you said, but just rotating it as they would in the wild, finding different animals, scavenging when they can't find a ton of prey, things like that. And I'm going to put Bryce on the spot here really quick. Can you just repeat that eating poop is okay? Oh, I'm the, I, (laughs) even myself, I'm like, stop eating poop. It's so gross, but it's so interesting to learn that like some of these. To the the diet, that may be a signal and Gus's gut may be the answer. Um, that pyramid can also be a square and all those things are interchangeable from day to day Got and there's it. an important word i haven't mentioned it's called homeostasis and that's how the body oh. works the body can take from what appears to be a food that doesn't have everything the dog requires if it's there in small amounts it will extract everything of that small thing if it's there in excess it will leave it there but it has to be real food. It can't be artificial food. In artificial food, the body's homeostatic mechanisms have not been trained by evolution to deal with that. But they have been trained to deal with actual food. And that's why we can get away with varying levels of those proportions. So that, that thing could be a square. So at the bottom, and some in some instances of that square, you might have vegetables. And the next one up, might be organ meat. I don't probably won't be. Probably, probably be raw meaty bones. But mm-hmm. and then it might actually the square might start to taper off at the top for the other things. But hey, it is very variable and variety. So homeostasis, variety, evolutionary balance, time of feeding not critical. Fasting is critical. Got it. So a lot of these, not necessary. a lot of these common myths that I mean, even we've believed up until this point. Whereas it seems like it's all. I have a bit of a conspiracy theory that there's people within the pet industry that want this to seem complicated. They want pet parents to feel overwhelmed about feeding a homemade diet. They want it. They want you to think that these ratios are set in stone, and if you don't do it right, you're going to mess up your dog. But um, it's so, actually true of processed pet food. Say more. Most of that is true of processed pet food. If you mess the ratio, that's why if you add too much of something else to a processed pet food, you can upset the balance. You can, and you can make something, but it takes a long time. Even then, having said that, it takes a long, long time to get a deficiency. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because we're actually, we're about to start an elimination diet with one of our dogs for a potential food allergy. And one of my first questions to our holistic vet was, okay, if I'm, you know, feeding this single protein and maybe a single fruit or vegetable source, 
the the diet's going to be deficient. And she said uh, – she didn't talk a lot about what you're talking about here, obviously, but she said, like, they can go a decent amount of time without having all of those nutrients – and it sounds like you're saying they're probably still getting them from that homeostasis, just pulling out even those small amounts. That's correct. Absolutely they are. Yeah. Just has to be real food. So I have Start a question. With real food. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I'm curious what your feeding schedule is like with your pets because we hear a lot about fasting and I, the more I hear about it, the more I'm kind of like, okay, this mm -hmm. is starting to make sense. So I'm curious, what are your feeding times like for your pets? I'm a married man. <laughs> a prophet is without any honor in his own country. There are rich <laughs> feeding times at our house. Got it. And... I think my wife in another lifetime must have been a Jew. And if you've ever heard a Jewish mother, eat. Mm. Eat. So our animals are very well fed. The only good thing is that I make the food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does a typical are. meal look like for you? I mean, I, I'm sure it changes all the time, but okay, uh, what you feed the dogs today? They had uh, chicken wings. Chicken wings in the morning for the dog, and then the, my bath patties in the evening. In fact, oh, very I made nice. made a batch of bath patties yesterday. It took me about three hours. In fact, the making of it is easy. It's the cleaning up afterwards that's the problem. But, Always um, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I've got, I bought, I used to buy our own product, but it got expensive mm -hmm. and hard to get because I moved house and, and also because I wasn't actively involved in the company because I, we actually got, well, I decided I want to promote the ideas more than the food and the food mm -hmm. was taking up when, I, when we had the business was just taking up all our time and it was horrible. So, really? um, once I had trouble getting, so I said, no, nah, I'm going to make our own. So I went and bought a commercial grinder. And it cost me under 400 Australian dollars, which is brilliant. And I've been mm -hmm. recommending to my people now that I do consults with to do exactly that, to make their own. Because you, and it, you just drop the chicken wing in and boom, straight out, mm -hmm. mince. Beautiful. And uh, so what did that work? I went to the shops yesterday. I bought um, lamb hearts. Chicken hearts, chicken liver, chicken giblets, which is mostly the the gizzard, um, mm -hmm. and then of course we had uh, had some pork belly strips. We had the chicken wings. We had chicken frames, and we just threw in some eggs and some yogurt and a bit of veggies. Not too much because I I just make the one batch for our cats at the moment, and then ground it all up and it's um, popped in, uh, froze it flat in bags popped it in the freezer, and uh, I'll go out in a little while, actually, before it sets too hard, and I'll separate them all so that they're the bags. And I, and I have them flat so that when I pull them out, literally I can break them apart even mm -hmm. and just have a... Have a um, then I can weigh out their, their food. But if I'm not around, it doesn't get weighed out. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, that's great. So... Um... So Obviously, basically, we feed them twice a day to a, to a, a moderately rigid schedule. Moderately, sure, um, sure. I'm not allowed to adhere to all my principles, but I understand. <laughs> I totally love, get that. Love overcomes so, principle. Yes, obviously, we've talked so much about raw meaty bones, and I am most people. You know, obviously, I think in the in North America, it's something like ninety four percent of people still feed kibble. So the majority of even our audience and people seeing this hear raw meaty bones, and they're like, "It's going to cause an obstruction. My dog's going to fracture their teeth." Obviously, we talked a little bit about the salmonella. So, are those valid concerns, or is it more of like? you have to kind of teach your dog or expose them even to this so they know how to do it properly and then it's not so much of a problem. I think that's, that's part of the answer. Start, start them early, yes. Um, some dogs will look at a bone and say, what the hell's that? I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. I'll <laughs> sniff it and, I, you know, and then they just walk away. I'm, 
give me some of that crunchy stuff that you normally give me. You know, that's, but the vast <laughs> majority say, oh, real food. Well, what do you? Why have you yeah. been withholding this for me for all of my life? You know, uh, so yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of dogs will grab it and try and swallow the whole thing down because they're used to doing, eating the way they eat. But anyway, and dogs are gulpers anyway, so that's the, that's yeah. the way they are. Um, so the the bone must be big enough that they've actually got to chew it. So you've got to match the bone to the dog liver. Like if it if it's just the right size for them to swallow and possibly get lodged in their trachea, that ain't a great idea if their enthusiasm is so great that they try and swallow it straight down. So it's a good idea to... The other thing is to do that, is, is to match the bone to the dog. But the other thing is this. If, if they are a gulper for bones and they really want to get them down, feed them something else first. Take the edge mm. off their hunger and then introduce the bone. Oh. Got it. So they're a little less ravenous. That's right. So a little less yeah. ravenous, and even if it's a bath patty or whatever. Um, so you just just use your. You've got to use your common sense. Must be bones. Use young animal. That's why we recommend chicken because mm. as a, as a, as abhorrent as it is, the chickens only live three months or even less, and raised under crowded conditions and are genetically made to grow quickly and possibly given antibiotics because that makes them grow faster. Goodness, it's something does something to their hormones. I never really look into it. But all of those things, but we do know that the chicken bones are relatively soft. They have used, well, it's an organic living creature, so it's relatively good. Um, that's probably the safest thing, particularly to start with, chicken, chicken wings particularly. That, that's what I use. So our dogs don't really like well, well. A lot of dogs don't like chicken necks as much. And if you're going to, if anything is going to actually go down the trachea, it would be a neck because yeah. it just fits mm. nicely down there. Yeah, same yeah. about and, same size exactly almost. <laughs> yeah, so, so I wouldn't start off a dog with that, or I would, or I would put them through a grinder or a mincer and grind them up first and feed them as a patty. That's because. And that's the way mum starts out with young dogs too, by the way. she like, Mum will go out and hunt or the rest of the pack will come in and they will barf. <laughs> they will bring up their, their food that they've gone out and hunted for the oh. young pups. And so they're getting pre-digested food. It's, the bone has been already pre-crunched to some degree and the puppies then get stuck into it. Um, but... The big thing is don't neglect bones because they're important. And they're particularly important for growing pups. Very important. And that's where the So that was one of my next questions was, is there an age restriction to this? Like, can you start feeding it? Say you get an eight-week puppy. Are they allowed to have raw meaty bones? Absolutely. Most definitely. What, if you, um, if you read grow your pups with bones the breeder's secret that nobody knows about but it's there <laughs> on the website um there's an there's a chapter on raising puppies and weaning puppies and i pointed out and this is this is what i did years ago with my own i would introduce those bones when the, when the pups were about three or four weeks old and what oh, we wow. see at that age they sniff them they have a bit of suck at them, and if they have teeth, they have a bit of bite them, depending on the breed at that stage. Then they will start to fight over them. And so they will rip and tear and pull. And they're doing fantastic isometric exercise. They're building up their muscles. They're also getting imprinted in their brain that this is food. And so by about six or seven weeks of age, they're actually eating it. Now, by this stage too, mum is really getting hating the fact that they've got their teeth and uh, it's really making her life pretty bad. But if they're lots of bones, <laughs> they, they will suck more gently on her teeth because they don't, they've had their eating exercise. They've had their biting and chewing exercise. So, oh, but this is so they just kind of have to get that out of their system first. Yes, that's right. And, got it. and the, the now they've tugged, they've, Put their feet down. They're ripped. They're teared. They're starting to eat this stuff, and so so that's that's the transition. And you know, all I did really was observe my own pups. Now, I was lucky because I grew up as a young man 
in a, on a farmhouse or we were poor, um, there was no floor in the bathroom and the dog up the road was a male and our, our dog would go up there about every six months, whatever it takes. I, I missed that lesson actually. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they would get together and have a good time and she would come back and, and a few weeks later, I think it was about nine, she would give birth, but she would give birth in a whelping hole that she dug in, in the floor in the, in the house. Wow. And that whelping hole, and I described the whelping hole in my book, Grey Pups with Bones, the whelping hole was absolutely brilliant. She would lie in that, curled around. When she stood up, all the pups went to the bottom of the hole. It wasn't flat. And when, when she lay down, she would very carefully curl herself around. And as she did, the milk bar was right there. And she wow. would give birth in that as well. And the pups would come out and she would curl around and she would lick them as they came out. And, and dogs can do that. Uh, and she would help pull them out. And they would fall to the bottom of the hole straight to the milk bar. And she would wow. there, she would lick them and clean them. And I said, this is the way it should happen. We don't need these flat whelping boxes. We need whelping holes. And a lot of people have adopted that. It's a bit of work if you do adopt it. But um, this has saved a lot of puppies' lives. And, of course, they're kept warm and they always sink to the bottom of the hole. There's no way they can roll to escape when mum gets up and she leaves them there. And so, anyway. So, the, you know, there's so many th practical things you can do if you look at what actually dogs want to do. In nature, dogs or a wolf will dig a, will dig a tunnel. And the tunnel goes up and then it goes down and then it goes up again and then spreads out. Water can't come in because it goes up first and it goes down. And predators have a hard oh. time. They're pretty worried about going into a dark space and it spreads out. And she can, and those puppies also, because it goes down again at the end, they're, they're protected in there. And that, there's a whelping hole in there. And that's, that's the way dogs in the wild, have, particularly wolves, will make their den. Wow. That's so, incredible. Yeah, well, we were uh, just talking to a good friend, Rachel Fasaro, who's li living out in California right now with all this crazy flooding going on. And she was mentioning how, like, a lot of the coyotes were in the area because their dens might have been flooded. But it's cool yeah. that, like, these animals might have a, an anti-flooding mechanism just built into their brain. You know, they kind of automatically do this. That's yeah, incredible. Well, flooding to some, unless the flood is absolutely enormous. In which case, of course, enormous. and they're getting an obscene amount of water this last couple of weeks. So. Yeah. Um, last question I want to ask you. So obviously, like you said, there's not really any studies out there comparing a, a lifelong kibble diet and a lifelong raw or fresh food diet. Personally, right. in your practice, you have over 40 years of experience. What benefits have you seen is specifically switching a dog from kibble to a raw diet? Everything. Absolutely everything. This, this everything. is the astounding thing. Everything. But I mean, initially, you get to see increases in activity. Mentation improves. The coat, of course, improves. Teeth improve. Breath improves. Stool improves. And then over a long period of time, the gener degenerative diseases don't happen. I remember reading a long time ago some book that they said, now, ageing, we can't do anything about it. It's, 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 and it's not a disease, but it seems to be associated with a lot of disease. Well... Aging is the principal disease, and we have to combat aging. Now, we can't combat programmed aging, but we can combat the aging that is caused by the lifetime attrition. And the biggest aging factor in our environment is food. Now, there are other things as well, but if, if we have the right food, it builds the resilience into the body to deal with other factors. It helps the body deal with toxins. It helps the body deal with um, pathogens. It helps the body deal with injuries. It helps the body have the right attitude to life. So all of these factors, and of course, if you have the right food, it's creating a microbiome in the gut, and we now know the microbiome is intimately involved in, the, in preventing aging, in creating a proper mind and of course in proper digestion and absorption of the nutrients we acquire but it's so simple if you feed a chicken wing for goodness sake feed it raw and don't try and remove all the pathogens or supposed pathogens on it 
make sure it's a human grade. You've got it it's been handled properly. There will be bacteria on it. Those bacteria are friendly to your dog, unless it's been raised in under atrocious conditions. But I always buy yeah. it from the soup. Well, I buy it very fresh from our li- local. Um, uh, what's, it's a um, it's a chain of supermarkets that, that is run by local people wherever it is, and, mm. and they oh, have cool. very fresh stuff. So I, we buy it very fresh. And, and Got it. That thing. But hey, it's that's that's how you build resilience. That's how you stop aging, and that's why we don't see these diseases because. The body is designed not to get sick. You see, the problem is we vets are trained to think of disease as normal. Mm-hmm. So we sit in our little boxes, animals come in with, that are diseased, and we say, yes, well, that's the age that gets this, and that's the age that gets this. Of course, that's, that's just the way it's been now for generations because there's been generations of animals being fed processed pet food, and, we, and, and even our blood normals are based on processed pet food. And we get a surprise, so BUN is going to be a bit higher uh, because the uh, intake of protein is higher on real food. And because we're feeding them like a, our dogs like a carnival, strangely enough. And the BU, uh, the creatinine will be higher. Why? Because the muscle, muscle mass of these dogs is better. They're more active. They, they've had a better food to create better muscles. And creatinine is based on muscle mass. So we see these things and we say, oh dear. This, this is, is a problem. This dog's got kidney problem. No, he hasn't. Sometimes we even see some of the liver enzymes raised. Why? I'm not sure. But, but there, is some, there was a fellow called Howell who wrote a book on enzymes uh, a long time ago, and he seemed to think that with real food we actually tend to absorb some of the enzymes and they're anti-aging. Things like, particularly things like um, papain and bromelain from, from papaya and, and um, uh, pineapples. But I suspect also real food to some degree because these are actually part of the anti-aging process. I put a maybe after that. But look, real food to your audience out there is not scary. Are you scared of real food, I ask you? You shouldn't be scared of it on behalf of your dog either. Start feeding it. You're going to see a real difference. Don't be afraid of it. Start understanding how the dog evolved. And look at raw meaty bones. They should form the basis of the diet. And if you're afraid of them, have them ground up. Buy a commercial grinder. Do it yourself. If you really want to be have a healthy dog, take charge. Then you will know exactly what goes into your dog's diet. It's, it is simple. It just takes a bit of understanding. But it's not yeah, understanding absolutely. of nutrition. It's understanding of evolutionary norms for a dog. So nothing in biology makes sense. Nothing in feeding our dog makes sense except in the light of evolution. Important words. Wow. Very well said. Well, Dr. Billinghurst, I think that's going to wrap it up here. As always, thank you so much for being on today. I think our audience is going to find a ton of value in this, and hopefully it just, if nothing else, gives them the confidence to start looking into this stuff and start exploring this this method. So. Um, if anybody's interested, we're going to link all of Dr. Billinghurst's books and everything below. He's doing a ton of stuff with Gussie's Gut, so be sure to check that out. Uh, Dr. Billinghurst, if you ha- if have anything you'd like to say to our audience or let them know where they can find you, please feel free. Oh, well, you can find me at Gussie's Gut, um, and that's one. And the other, of course, is my website. Um, I, I don't do social media. I'm not a social media animal. Um, I've, got, I've actually got a website. Well, our audience is going to love you. I can assure you of that. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but just again, go to the website, they... www.dranbillinghurst.com. That's, that's a dranbillinghurst.com. I and we'll have it linked anyway. below as yeah, well. Below. Yeah. But I, I am so unsavvy with that. Well, you you do incredible work for dogs everywhere, even if you're not on the social media game. So again, yes. thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have you on again in the future. And uh, to anyone listening, thank you so much for watching this episode. We will see you in the next one. And tell your pets we said hello. Thank you.